So today we're starting with the apology, and you've, you've probably looked at your reading list. So you see that we have quite a few works by Plato, and you know if you if you think about your your Western Civ classes or history classes, whatever it is that you had previous to this, you know where Plato fits in. He's in ancient Greece, and why are we reading him first? Well, he's one of the first philosophers, right? Aristotle's going to come after him, Epictetus and Epicurus will come later, and so on down the line. And you can place them in a succession. And that's one way to, to make sense out of these things. And I will be posting some things like uh, timelines for you in, in the next couple of weeks to help you figure that out. But why are we beginning with this particular dialogue? Um, some of this I'm going to you know, want some, some response from you. Some of this I'm just going to sort of plow through. So I don't assume that anybody here knows that much about Plato or Platonic dialogues or how they're organized or anything like that, right? This is a basic introductory class, so I, I, shouldn't, ha I shouldn't presume anything along those lines. Um, but you can relate this to, to other things that you have studied. Um, chronologically, it makes sense to, to look at this dialogue first. Chronologically means what? What are we talking about there? In order, what else? I heard somebody else say time. Chronos is, is Greek for time. Um, so a chronology is sort of a, a structured order to things, it's like a schedule. Um, in this case, we're looking at the, you know, why pick on this particular point in time? Uh, you know, Socrates and Plato, I'm not sure if all of you know this, they were not the first philosophers. Philosophy had been going on in Greece for quite a while, it, not necessarily on the Greek um, mainland, but in, in other parts of the Greek-speaking world. So why aren't we starting with those guys? Other than the fact that this is an intro class and we only have you know 15 weeks and we have to pack these in. Yeah. Oh, were these the first like major famous philosophers? Or that yeah, that's famous? that's a good way to think about it. Um, I mean, major in, in, in a sense that I'll get to. The other people that we would look at, they're called pre-Socratics. Socrates is so important that we look at everything as, before him as, as pre-Socratic, pre-Socrates. Sort of the way in, um, you know, reckoning uh, B.C. and A.D. Right? Socrates set a sort of point. Um, or, you know, in ancient Rome, they would, they would count from the founding of the Roman Empire. Um, they were important, but there was something different about them. There was something lacking that Socrates and, and Plato brought to the fore. Um, Socrates gets credited for, as they say, bringing philosophy down to earth. Um, we're going to see a contrast in this dialogue between Socrates as a person who's very concerned with, with human matters and the kind of wisdom that's possible for human beings. And if you were to read some of these pre-Socratic philosophers, like, say, Parmenides or Heraclitus, they were concerned with much broader metaphysical topics. They wanted to know what things were made of, fundamentally, not just, you know, this desk is made out of wood or my body is made out of flesh. Uh, or certain elements. They wanted to know what was the basic building blocks of things. What, what explained change? What explained the passing of time? Those sorts of things. Um, but they weren't very systematic. They didn't leave a lot behind. And they spent a lot of time, you might say, with their head in the clouds. As a matter of fact, one, one of them, Thales, actually got uh, made fun of because he used to do so much sky gazing. He, uh, he fell into, I think it was a, either a ditch or a well. Now, he, he got his revenge because all that sky gazing allowed him to predict something. What would it allow him to predict? What do you think? When the sun came up? I well, I mean, you know, the, I mean, the sun's going to come up, right? Um, but if you're, if you're paying close attention to the seasons, you might be able to predict how the weather's going to be. And he did. And he figured out when it was going to be a really good olive harvest, and he bought up all the presses. He established a monopoly, and then he made a fortune. Um, so it just goes to show you some of that stuff could be useful. Socrates is not concerned with that sort of thing, though. He's concerned with, yeah. Oh, can I run to the bathroom? Sure. All right, thank you. 
Um, he's concerned with um, more human issues. Who's wise? What is wisdom? We're going to see in this dialogue as he's talked about. What is justice? What is courage? What's the right kind of way to live? Those are things you don't have to know much about chemistry or you know, cosmology, the nature of the universe, in order to, to think about, right? Um, people think about these things all the time, and you guys get into arguments. Guaranteed, every single one of you has been in some argument with somebody about how you ought to behave or how you ought to live. So Socrates is bringing philosophy down to earth. Plato then, Plato becomes very concerned with what we call metaphysics, um, which is, you know, the sort of study of what's ultimately real, what's, what's most existent or true or underlying everything else. And he does something new as well. First of all, he writes things down. Socrates never wrote anything down. So everything that we've got from Socrates and Plato is not coming from Socrates actually writing stuff and then Plato taking it. It's from, from you know, Plato either hearing it from somebody or he was there or he made some of it up, using Socrates as a, a character in some cases. Um, but Plato does something different. He works things out systematically. So if you, if you read only this dialogue, you're not going to see that. But as you read more and more of Plato, you get to see the, the scheme come together. You start to see things applying to each other, the parts fitting into each other. That's what it means to be systematic. He also um, looked at these earlier thinkers, these pre-Socratics, and he sometimes said, well, I think they were partly right about this, but partly wrong about this. He was being critical. And to be critical in, in philosophy doesn't mean just to be mean or, or you know, to cut people down or things like that. It means to look at things very closely and, and to try to figure out where is somebody actually correct, where is somebody incorrect. It's very rare that somebody is entirely correct, that the position that they have is, is unassailable. Um, there's usually something wrong. It's very rare to find somebody who's totally, you know, absolutely wrong, too. Um, there's usually some truth in what they're saying. So that's what Plato did with his predecessors. Uh, the other thing that he did that was, that was new is he worked uh, philosophy through dialogues. Um, how many of you started going ahead and reading the, the Credo so far? A few of you? Okay. Um, what do you notice that's different between this piece and, and the Credo? Yeah. It's all dialogue. It's all dialogue. This one, we call it a dialogue, but it's not really a dialogue, is it? There, there's a portion of it that's a dialogue where Socrates is cross-examining one of his accusers, but for the most part it's just Socrates giving a speech. And you can kind of see some dialogue, right? He, he recounts, um, well, I talked with so-and-so and I said this and he said this, uh, but it's not actual dialogue taking place with the credo. Socrates is, is where? He's in jail, he's in his prison cell, because the apology, things didn't turn out the way he, he, he hoped, or maybe they did. Um, and he's talking with Credo, and then he's also talking with another character. Do you remember? Brian Galloway, correct. Okay. The, it's going to be quite interesting when, when it does take place, uh, when, you, when you get into it. But it's, it's all dialogue. For the most part, Plato's works are dialogues like that. They're like a play. All of you, you remember back in literature classes, you read some Shakespeare, or you read some O'Neill, or you read this or that. Um, with most plays, can you tell what the author thought about things? Or not? Think about Shakespeare, for example. Yeah. Uh, I think generally you can. How? Um, usually just from... Uh the way they, uh, sometimes the, just the way they uh, express, like maybe they'll write about a particular issue, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess through it, it'll just sort of, uh, it'll just sort of see through the tone of the way they speak, I guess. Okay. What were you well, going to say? Well, the tone conveys a lot of his opinions to the characters in these plays. Yeah, and so that would be in part through tone, right? You, somebody's mocking somebody else, somebody's praising somebody else. 
what if you've got um, several different characters and um, some of them are praising a person and, and the others are saying this person's a, a terrible, you know, horrible uh, murderer, liar, pick whatever you want. How do you tell what the author thinks then? Yeah. Oh, you don't have your hand up. Okay. Um, how, do you, how do you figure that out? Maybe sometimes the, the author doesn't want you to know exactly what they think, or they want you to think about both sides. Plato's dialogues, you can usually figure who's going to be the, the guy that is representing Plato. Socrates, right? But Plato is, is pretty fair. He'll put good arguments in other people's mouths because he wants you to think about them. He wants his readers to try to see if there, if there are, is something there. Um, Socrates doesn't always win. There are a few dialogues where he, he doesn't come out that well. Um, but writing dialogues, that was something new in philosophy. And it caught on. Um, we don't actually have these dialogues. But some of the other people that you're going to read, from what we know from ancient authors, Aristotle wrote dialogues too, apparently. We don't have any of them, unfortunately. Because they're supposed to have been very good. Um, Epicurus is supposed to have written dialogues. Um, this, this caught on as a way to try to teach people. And it's part of what we model in, in class. That's why it's important to have the participation the back and forth. So far, you guys are just you know, raising single points or asking questions. Um, but I encourage you to, um, to speak up, to engage in dialogue. Um, why else is it good to start with this one? Well, it, it can be kind of useful because it's, it's easier than some of Plato's other texts. Again, because it, it doesn't have a lot of different voices. It's Socrates pretty much all the way through. Um, it's a pretty easy to grasp situation. And not in the sense that any of you are hopefully, to, hopefully none of you are going to be in such a situation on trial for your life, right? But it's an easy enough situation for you to make sense of. Somebody is accused of, of committing a crime. Um, they're defending themselves. They're explaining their actions. They're explaining uh, why people are prejudiced against them. So that, that's one that's easy to get. Uh, it also contains a couple good arguments and a couple bad arguments. So it's, it's a nice training ground for you. Uh, for instance, later on we're going to look at those arguments about death. Um, some of the arguments Socrates makes aren't very good arguments at all. And, and we'll, we'll walk through that in the, in the class. Uh, could be because of things that are left out, could be because of, you know, verbal sleight of hand. Uh, and you can ask yourself, why does that happen? The other, um, the other reason why we start with this is it's a really good dialogue for introducing you to who is this guy Socrates? Um, why is he important? You know, he was just a, a, an Athenian living back in the... Uh, fourth, fifth century. Why should we care about him? What did, what did he do? Well, you know, we can um, learn a little bit about his stance, how philosophy in some ways comes out of what Socrates is doing. Plato catches the fever for philosophy from this guy Socrates. And it wasn't because Socrates was good looking or, you know, anything like that. If you, have any of you ever seen any images of Socrates? I'll, I'll put some, you, just, you, you made kind of a face when you did that. Why? Uh, well, he always just seems like a really like, old man with like, long hair and like, long beard and stuff. And he just doesn't seem like the most like, attractive guy. Ever. You're understating it, I think. He, he, he's, he's ugly. Yeah. He's really, he's really, uh, not he's not hideous, but he's, he's ugly. Um, but there was something very, very attractive about his personality. You know, often we say, ah, you know, this person is not good looking, but they have a nice personality. That was the case with Socrates. Um, why were people so attracted to him? That's part of what we, we need to think about. Why do people want to have him around? He becomes kind of a hero. And the apology is one of the points, the credo also, uh, the, the apology is one of the points where he is entering into history as kind of a hero, or a model, or example. Um, 
And I'll just give you a few examples of, of some people that we're going to look at over the course of the semester, and also one who were not, and how Socrates affected them. You know, Plato, of course, is very impressed by Socrates. And Plato, Plato was um, a rich, very good looking, strong. The Pla Plato is actually coming from, it's not his original name, it means broad. You know, he, he was a big brawny guy. Um, and he had all the advantages in life. So what did he do? He gave him up and hung around with this old man. Uh, and then spread his, his ideas here and there. Um, so Plato uh, is, is one of the people who's influenced by him. But Socrates left some other people behind. Uh, another, one, another one of his followers, his name was Antisthenes. And Antisthenes founds a school called the Cynic School. You know, when we talk about cynicism, we use the word in a slightly different way than they did back in the Greek times. Um, but the cynics were devoted to trying to live a life of virtue and truth and stripping away everything that was false from their lives. A life of non-attachment, a life you know, of being honest with yourself and being honest with others. Antisthenes got this from Socrates. And that goes on and eventually influences another school that we're going to study during this, this class called the Stoics. One of the people who's influenced by the Stoics, who becomes a, a major Stoic philosopher, is Epictetus, who we're going to read. And Epictetus considered Socrates to be sort of a model for what the ideal philosopher ought to be like, what the ideal life ought to look like. Um, later on, you know, fast forwarding, Socrates is one of those people that Christian thinkers worried about. Um, why do you think they worry about him? I mean, he's long dead, right? by the time that Christianity shows up on the scene? Why would they be concerned with him? Other than, you know, he's an interesting guy to read. Yeah? Uh, maybe he, like, proposed ideas that would conflict things that the Catholic Church is like, using? There were some things along those lines. Um, as a matter of fact, well, it's not so much Socrates. Plato's philosophy, if you read it in a certain way, it leads to um, Gnosticism, right? Um, but, it, but Plato is also called the divine Plato by a lot of Catholic and, and Orthodox theologians because they took so much of his philosophy. It wasn't that. Um, did you have your hand up back there? Or are you just combing your hair? Um, what could you be concerned about with somebody who's long dead? Let's say you, let's say you, you adopt you know, sort of a Christian perspective on the afterlife. I'll give you some, some guidance. Let's say we accept the Christian notion of, you know, heaven, hell, uh, bless you, and you're, and you're there eternally. Where do you think Hitler is? Anybody think he's in heaven? Anyone want to, you know, if you had to place a bet, would you place it on that? Anybody think he's probably in hell? Probably a good chance of that. Now, nobody actually minds Hitler being in hell, do they? Except, you know, maybe a, a, a few people who really like Hitler. But thankfully, there's not many of them left. Um, what about Socrates? Let's say you're a, a medieval Christian thinker. You're working, say, within the Catholic Church, or, you know, Eastern Orthodox Church. And you're, you're studying Plato. And you think to yourself, wow, you know, this guy said a lot of things that sound an awful lot like St. Paul. Um, <coughs> bless you. Um, he seems to have been a really good guy. It's a shame he's in hell. This is the, what we call the problem of the virtuous pagans. What would God do with, and, and this is you know, not an issue that we're actually going to explore in the class, I just want to bring it up to you. It's something that people talked about quite a bit. You know, what about people who didn't know the, you know, the, the Christian religion, didn't have an opportunity to, um, but they lived really good lives. You know, would a supremely good God say, "Ah, eh, sorry, you missed you missed your chance." That you know, that's one of those open philosophical and theological questions. So Socrates took up you know a lot of uh, thought that way. He was sort of the example of, of the virtuous pagan. Uh, for Kierkegaard, who we're going to read at the very end of the semester, he saw Socrates 
as what he called the teacher, the model of, of the teacher. And if you ever hear your, your professors talking about, well, how do I teach? I teach through Socratic, the Socratic method. What are they doing? They're modeling themselves off of Socrates, who, at least you know, as far as Plato seems to think, thought that the truth was within all of us. And it just required some, some cultivation, some asking questions, some challenging people to get them to be able to bring it forth if they had it within them. Nietzsche, on the other hand, who we're not going to, unfortunately, get to read this semester, he thought Socrates was actually a terrible guy. That with Socrates and this Greek playwright, playwright Euripides, philosophy and culture and all that just went to hell. And it's been going downhill ever since. Socrates is an emblem of everything that was, was wrong because of his method, because of what he, he did. And so we're going to see this in the apology that we're looking at today. Um, so let's, let's actually look at, at the apology. What are the official charges against Socrates? What's he up for? Two things, yeah. Atheism. Atheism, right. Atheism, and what's the other one? Um, yeah, wasn't it corrupting the youth? Corrupting the youth, exactly. So taking the young people of the society and making them, them worse, right? These are the official charges that he's facing. Um, who's bringing them? These, these young men who are uh, fairly ambitious. They're kind of, you know, up and coming, uh, you know, mover and shaker types, Miletus, Antius, and a few others. Um, and, and why do they bring these charges? Well, it's about time somebody did something about this Socrates guy and the sort of things that he's bringing about, especially with the youth. And these two are kind of connected together, aren't they? Because if, if your society is a, a fairly religious society, then messing around with the religion and teaching things that go contrary to it, that's going to be corrupting the youth, isn't it? And if you're corrupting the youth, you're kind of getting them ready for, for going against societal norms, going against the things that we ought to... To, to all believe. Um, so, he, uh, he gets Miletus to actually say something. And it, I don't know if you guys caught that when you're looking at the actual dialogue portion. Um, there was kind of a question, what, is, what does it mean, atheism, in this? And you notice that, what do we, what do we usually mean? We say atheism, yeah. That you don't believe in God? Yeah, no belief in, in God or anything divine. Um, and that's what Miletus eventually says. I think you don't believe in any gods. You think that the moon is just a rock, um, and, and so on. Um, what else is a possibility? What else does Socrates um, put out on the table? Maybe he believes in gods, but what kind of, yeah? Doesn't he ask if he believes in like, the legitimate gods and like, people that are like, prophets? And yeah, maybe he believes in Yeah, maybe he believes in the wrong gods. Maybe he doesn't believe in the gods of that culture, of that city. Maybe he's teaching something that goes against the religious orthodoxy. Um, but he gets Miletus to say, no, no, I mean you you don't believe in anything, Socrates. As a matter of fact, you're you're teaching that. Um, what is corrupting the youth opposed to in this dialogue? What would be the opposite of corrupting. Yeah. Like teaching the youth about the gods and the stuff that they had back then or something? Maybe? Yeah. Um, although it doesn't necessarily have to be about the gods. Corru if, I, if I corrupt you, I could corrupt you in a lot of different ways. Um, maybe I, you know, I, I structure my philosophy class so all of you come in here um, you know, with, with a you know, strong religious faith and you leave here believing in nothing. Or on the other hand, maybe you come in here believing in nothing and I get you to believe in some, some weird cult, right? I'd be corrupting you. That would be in terms of religion, but there's other ways I could corrupt you too, aren't there? You know, get you all to start smoking. I don't know, maybe some of you already smoke, you know. Not, not so many in your generation as in my generation. Um, when I was in, in college, believe it or not, this is going to sound bizarre to you guys, I was a smoker. 
And after class would end, we would light up in the classroom. And we would ash in our, our you know, soda cans. And if you wanted to have a talk with the professor, you just come up and the professor would probably be smoking too. And, um, you know, you couldn't smoke while class was in session. And then they passed a law that said um, you can't smoke in public buildings. And we never realized just how bad we smokers had made it for the non-smokers and just how much haze there was in, in our main classroom building. Because you could tell the difference after just a couple of days. And then, you know, within a year, we realized our behavior had been really crazy. You know, just, just lighting up all the time. And the generation before mine, the professors used to smoke while they would teach. Yeah. Well, you were that smoking law passed. When was that particular smoking law passed? Yeah, uh, that was, well, that was in Wisconsin, and that was in 1992, I think. Oh, okay. Different states passed different, different laws okay. uh, at different times. Um, I, I was in, in college from 90 to 94, so it was like right in the middle of mine. But, but yeah, they used to actually have ashtrays in classrooms for the professors, because, you know, they would, they would smoke. So nowadays we see smoking as a, a terrible, terrible vice, right? So it's not only healthy, or not, not only healthy, it's not only unhealthy. <laughs> if I get you to believe it's healthy, I'm corrupting you. Uh, it's not only unhealthy, but, you know, it makes you stink. And it makes you kind of a degenerate to do. And, and you know, you, you've, you've probably all been exposed to this, this sort of thing. So if I get you to all become smokers, I'm corrupting you, aren't I? Um, so I, I could be, instead of corrupting the, the youth, what should he be doing? He should be teaching and improving. Improving what? I mean, there's a lot of different things that, that we could improve. Um, this isn't the sort of class that's going to improve your financial position. There are classes that you could take here, I think, that probably would in finance, right? Um, what, what would you be improving by hanging out with a philosopher? Your morals. Yeah, there we go, your morals. What do we mean by that? Um, what you think is good and what, how you do things and how you live your life, I guess. That, that's a good answer, I think. What you think is good, so beliefs about good and bad, right and wrong, um, perhaps even about the, the noble or the, the, the you know, shameful or something like that. And then what do you say? Um, actions? Behavior? Yeah, how you live your life. Right? How you live your life. Okay, yeah. Um, so if Socrates is corrupting the youth, he is making them less and less moral. It's not a matter now of smoking, it's a matter of like, you know, killing people, or stealing, or lying about people, or causing discord. Um, that's what corrupting the youth would, would actually be. Um, what, is, what do we know that he actually does with the youth from the text? What, what, is, what is his um, characterization? I mean, some of them he doesn't like, like Miletus. Miletus is a young man, but Miletus doesn't like Socrates either. A lot of these young men do like Socrates. What do they do? Yeah? Don't they, like, go with him when he, like, questions people's wisdom? Yes. And, and then what happens? That, that by itself isn't that bad, right? They're just providing an audience. Although, you know, providing an audience could be a problem because it turns out the people who are being questioned don't like it. Then what do they do? They go a little bit further, don't they? What do you remember from, from the, the dialogue? If you see somebody doing something, and then you hang out with them while they're doing it, you're going to start doing it. Yeah, you're going to start doing it. And now Socrates is a bit more gentle, at least according to himself, right, than these young men. Um, and it makes sense, doesn't it? Young, young people, I mean, you're all young people. I remember what it was like to, to be young. Um, I was a real hothead. I would get in people's faces about things and argue with them and uh, shout and 
I don't think I ever got in a, a fight over philosophy. Um, my dad did. Not, not over um, uh, Socrates or Plato or anything like that. He actually got in a fight in a Wisconsin bar uh, over whether Hitler was, was uh, good or not. He was holding that Hitler was not, and the other people in the bar thought that Hitler was good, <coughs> which was a more common belief back, back then. Um, well, the young men, they, they're pretty aggressive. They go after people a lot more aggressively than, than Socrates does. Socrates is doing it because what? Why is he doing it? So he can learn. So he can learn. He wants to, to, to know something. Uh, the young men have maybe that motive, but they also have some other motives. What are their other motives? Yeah. Maybe they try to prove themselves to Socrates or something? You know, um, he doesn't say that in the dialogue, but that's probably a good supposition because these are, these are young men who look up to Socrates, and so how do you, you know, prove your worth? You, you try to show that you can do the same sort of thing. Um, that, that's an interesting uh, conjecture. What is, does anyone remember what Socrates actually says? Why, why they go around questioning people now, uh, sort of freelancing? Because they like it, because it's fun, because it's entertaining. You know, to, to take people who think they know and tear them down, maybe even people who do know. Because, you know, if they're not quick enough on their feet to defend themselves against argument, these young men, you know, can tear them down. Think about, um, I've got sort of a comparison here. Think about comedy. What is, is most comedy gentle in your experience? Have any of you ever gone to a comedy club? Only a few? You should go. It, it, it's, I don't actually like going because I don't like conflict that much. People will get in conflict at comedy clubs. Um, and it'll happen a couple different ways. Sometimes the comic will start you know, picking on people in the audience. That's one sure way to get a laugh. Um, some comics actually like, you know, their whole show is like that. Um, other com comics will get heckled from the crowd because the crowd will say things to them and then they'll start saying things back and forth. Um, or, you know, comics will do what? They'll make fun of other people that aren't in the room. It's, it's actually pretty rare that you find comedy that isn't at the expense of somebody. Now, the ancient Greeks, especially in Athens, they had comedy. And their comedies, have any of you ever read uh, any ancient Greek comedies like Aristophanes' works? I hope that you do in your college career. Um, we tend to think of these ancient Greeks as if, you know, well, they're, they were a lot earlier than us, so they, they, they don't know anything about perversion or, you know, uh, bawdiness or, you know, rude behavior or anything like that. Read one of Aristophanes' plays. You'll see um, that anything goes. No holds barred. And they had a special time to do this. It was during certain festivals. They didn't do it all the time. Um, during Greek comedies, during these, these plays, they would actually have a portion of the play where they, they all wore masks at the time. You guys are all familiar with those, those masks, you know, the tragedy masks and the comic masks. They would take them off and they would come out into the audience and they would say, Hey, you, you voted for that measure last month. That was really stupid. Here's why. And by the way, your wife, blah, 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 blah. Um, that's the way Greek comedy was. People put up with that because it was within certain limits. Now imagine you've got this guy Socrates who's doing something kind of funny and kind of entertaining and he's got all these followers who are going around and imitating him but they're doing so in such a way as to maybe get away from the spirit of what Socrates was about and they're deriving a lot of enjoyment from it. Uh, it's surprising he didn't get himself killed earlier if that was the case, isn't it? in a society where that's how you, you settle things. Um, so these are the, the old, the new charges. What are the old charges that get made against this guy, Socrates? Yeah. Impiety? Yeah, and impiety is, is like atheism. Um, 
It's not treating divine things rightly. There's some other charges that, that Socrates actually brings up um, word for word. He says, uh, some people say that he's a wise man who speculated about the heaven above and searched into the earth beneath. So he's, he's wise and inquisitive. Into what? Into nature. And that could be impious because, you know, a lot of people thought that natural phenomena were the work of the gods or actually manifestations of the gods. Yeah? Wait, so just to clarify, impiety is like not treating the gods correctly and atheism is just not believing in them at all? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and as, as a matter of fact, one of the dialogues that we were going to look at, but we're, we're not going to have time to, uh, the euthyphro is all about piety and impiety. Piety is the proper attitude towards the gods or toward divine things. Impiety is the wrong uh, uh, attitude towards them. What else? They also say that he um, makes the, the worse clause or arguments. And we should probably put in here parentheses. Here. Um, how many of you feel that you're terrible in argument, that you can't convince people of anything? A few of you? Okay, how many of you would say you're great at it? Like you're on your debate team, or you know, you, you'll get in arguments with people just because you like you know, doing that, and you know you're very competent. What about the rest of you? You're all more or less in the middle? You've all encountered people who can take a bad argument and make it sound good, right? You may have been bested by them at one time. Um, con artists do this. But people also do it in politics. They do it in debating about things. They do it in personal relationships. Sometimes people get talked into doing things. And it seems like a, a good thing at the time because somebody convinces them, right? That's making the worst argument or the worst cause look better. And there was a whole class of people who did this professionally um, in Socrates' time called the sophists, or the rhetoricians. So they're saying that he's one of those. Um, what else? He also says, well, they say I'm a teacher, uh, which he is, but that he takes money for teaching. Um, now, why would that be a bad thing? I'm getting paid, right? Of course, I, I have to live on that. Socrates didn't yet. He, he was more or less independently wealthy. You're trying to say he's not teaching anything worthwhile? Like it's all fake, what are you saying? Yeah. If, if you're... This, this applies to your university education. You guys are actually paying pretty good money for the, the education that you're getting compared to people going to state school, right? It's a private school. You want to be getting something back. So if you get some professor who doesn't give you a syllabus and just breezes in and talks about some stuff and then, you know, ah, just write me a paper and then walks out, uh, you're probably going to feel cheated, aren't you? And if you get to the end of the semester and you don't have, and you put in your work and you put in your time and you don't have anything where you can say, this is definitely what I learned in this class and here's what I'm going to take to the next class, again, you'll feel cheated. Somebody took your money and they didn't, they didn't give you something in return. Um, well, that was a, a big problem at the time. The sophists were, were teaching and taking money like that. Um, so these are the other charges. And who's making these, these charges against them? Well, just about everybody. Um, and he, he points to, you know, the comic playwright who, who made fun of him. Uh, actually, his friend, Aristophanes. Um, but... Uh, who else? Well, just about everybody who Socrates has crossed, they're saying these things. And the younger kids, the ones who are bringing the charges, they believe this stuff. And why are people going to vote against him? Because they believe this stuff too. But what's the real motive for them? What's their real animus against Socrates? What did he do that was wrong in their eyes?
This is one of the core points of the, the piece. What did you do that, that they thought was wrong? Uh, didn't they tell people that they weren't wise enough? Like, they go in the house and they like, say they're not wise. Yeah. They know nothing. Yeah. Um, and, and it's interesting you said wise enough first and then now you know nothing, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and there's sort of a, a play in there. Um, if you read the dialogue through several times, you'll see he kind of fluctuates between not knowing anything, these people don't know anything at all, and while well, some of them know something, but not enough. And, and he claims that he does know something by not knowing something, which is a little what we call paradoxical. Um, how do people feel when you take what, what they claim about themselves and show that it's wrong? In general, yeah. Well, they feel insulted and sometimes get like mad that you like prove them wrong. Yeah. So if I if I think that I'm a um, great singer and you listen to me and I sound terrible and you say, you know, you are not a good singer. I think you should um, just stick to doing the philosophy a bit. Um, now, if my ego is involved, I'll get angry. And I'll, I'll, my feelings will be hurt. I'll be insulted. Um, what happens when we get angry? This isn't actually talked about in the dialogue, but think about your own experience. You always let everything go. Have any of you ever been, you know, shown up like that? Somebody made you made you look bad. Something that you felt yourself to be good in. Um, you can be angry with them or hurt. If you hold on to that, what does it turn into? Yeah, a grudge. And, and a grudge is a form of hatred. Hatred is stronger than anger. Hatred is more lasting. Um, like Aristotle says, the angry person wants the other person to suffer. The person who hates wants them not to even exist. They want them off the map. And this is what these people want with Socrates. Uh, because he's standing in the way of their, their identity. Their feeling about themselves. Their... their views on themselves. Um, you know, the same thing could, could happen with studying philosophy. Right? I, I hope that over the course of this semester, some of the beliefs that you have about yourself will get called into question and maybe changed or maybe held on to. If, if they're good beliefs and you call them into question, they'll stand up to it, right? Um, but you won't know unless you actually do question them. You examine them living what Socrates called the, the examined life. So who does he go around to? Well, let, actually, before we talk about that, let's, let's look at this, this narrative. Where does he, where does not Socrates go, where does his friend go that starts this whole chain of events in this narrative? The oracle. The oracle, right. So this involves religion. And you notice Socrates isn't really an atheist, is he? Because he believes that the, the god at Delphi, Apollo, actually is giving him something that he has to think about and something he has to do. He actually says the God can't lie because it would be against the God's nature. So he does believe in gods and he does believe some things that seem to be pretty on track about, about the gods. Um, so Chiron is kind of a what we'd call a smart ass. So he goes and he asks the oracle at Delphi, you know, about this Socrates guy. Uh, is there anyone wiser than him? And the oracle says no. And he comes back and he tells Socrates, ah, guess what, guess what I found out? You're the wisest guy in Greece. And Socrates says, well, I, that doesn't make any sense. And there you actually see an argument, don't you? Um, let's reconstruct that argument. So, oracle says, nobody wiser than, I'm going to read it here, Socrates, right? Um, what does Socrates then start, how does the chain of reasoning go from there? The oracle said nobody is wiser than me, but I'm not wise. Or, better to say, Socrates doesn't think himself wise. So, maybe the guy
God's wrong, right? But to the God can't lie. So there must be something going on here. How could anybody, you know, who doesn't think that they're wise, be wise? Well, how is Socrates wise? How does it turn out? What does his wisdom consist in? It's kind of again, it's paradoxical. It's it's a thought where uh, it almost seems to contradict itself. Yeah. He says he's wise because he knows he's not wise. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go in two directions with this. Socrates is wise. He is really wise because he knows. Not wise and doesn't know anything. What about the other people who Socrates? I, you know, these guys should be wiser than me, right? They they claim to be wise. I don't claim to be wise. Yeah. Uh, the people who say they're wise don't really realize that they're not actually wise. Yeah. And we just say they're deluded. their own wisdom. So they're worse off, aren't they? Then people who believe them are worse off. Socrates is actually, yeah, he's not actually um, attaining any great wisdom, but at least he knows what his limitations are. These other people don't. And now let's think about who are these these people. It may be very hard for you to relate to these these groups of people at the start. Um, who are the people, who are the classes of people that he goes to? Yeah. Well, he kind of like starts to become the Marxist right now. He like starts the politician. Yeah. Politicians. Yeah. Politicians. Yeah, that's the last group he goes to, right? And, um, did I spell it right? Yeah. Sometimes I just spell things. If I do, tell me, yeah. I'm a poet. Poets, yeah. And then if you catch it, a little bit later on, um, he'll actually slip in a fourth group, which is the rhetoricians um, and sophists. It's when he's talking, rhetoricians. It's when he's talking about who's actually bringing the indictment against him and why they're, they're doing it, on whose behalf. Um, now, politicians, we know who they are, right? Every four years, every two years, we elect some of them. You have local politicians. Um, these are the people who make things happen within society. Um, imagine now a, a, a state that's very small. Think about, say, Rhode Island, um, instead of like the state of New York, which is pretty vast. Rhode Island's pretty small. I think it's only got three counties. Um, and each one of those counties, you know, is sort of like a city state. And then the larger municipality. When you've got a state that small, you could know a lot about the people who you're electing. New York, it's a bit harder, isn't it? Yeah, a huge state. And New York City just, you know, dominates everything because it's got so many people. Um, but politicians, okay, we can wrap our heads around that. What, what does he mean by artisans? What do you think he means there? Yeah. Like craftsmen and people who do, like, work requiring their hands. Exactly. So, uh, tradespeople, craftspeople. So, for instance, in our day, um, plumbers, electricians, iron workers would be artisans. It's perhaps a, an unfortunate word choice for the translation because it makes you think of like uh, people out there painting and, and, and doing things like that. They would actually be closer to the Poets. Um, rhetoricians. Have any of you ever met a rhetorician? Um, you have, actually. Or you've at least met somebody who studied rhetoric. Um, all of you had high school English teachers, right? One of the things you can specialize in English is what we call rhetoric and composition, ret comp. And what they study are how to use language persuasively. That's what rhetoric is. Um, 
Now think about in our society, who uses language persua persuasively besides people in politics? They, they of course, do, right? Um, you, you have some people who do it with speech. That's what the rhetoricians did back then. But we have a lot more of this in our society than the, the ancient Greeks did. Where else do you find rhetoric being used every single day of your um, experience? Lawyers. Okay, lawyers, yeah. In the business world. In the business world, especially in, in, in what? In finance? Advertising. Not finance. In advertising. advertising, yeah. I was going to say, I was looking for marketing, but advertising is even broader. Who are you going to say? I was going to say advertising. Yeah. But I would say business like sales, too? Yes, sales would also be, actually, sales would be somewhat more like the classic rhetoricians because they tend to be working uh, more directly with language, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, more with, with crowds. But marketing, uh, advertising, all of that fits into rhetoricians. They're trying to use language to persuade people. As a matter of fact, every time you see one of those public service uh, ads, it doesn't always have to be a product. It can just be, you know, the more you know. You know? Uh, don't drink and drive. If they're, if they're sculpting it in such a way as to not really give you an argument, or just appeal to, to um, your emotions, they're, they're effectively doing rhetoric. I mean, some of those ads are, are pretty great. I like the ones where they, they open up the car and all the, you know, the liquor pours out. You know, I find myself wanting to, you know, to, to know which, which kind of liquor it's going to be. You know, this guy's beer, this guy's wine, this guy's it's, it's, it's clearly you know, some sort of whiskey. Um, they're great ads, but all they really are is, is rhetoric. This leaves us with the, the talker one. Um, the, the Greeks had poets. We have poets, right? Where do, where do poets hang out? Coffee shops, right? They do poetry slams, and maybe they publish in literary magazines. Yeah. What are poets like? We used to have a joke back when I was in college. The one thing a poet hates the most is another poet. What are poets like in our, in our society? We don't have a lot of them, do we? Greeks don't actually mean the same thing by poet as somebody you know, in the corner scribbling verses. I've done that. I used to write sonnets. Actually, I still do every once in a while. Um, that's not what they mean. What was, do any of you know, what was Greek poetry like? What did, what did that mean? Have any of you read the Odyssey or the Iliad? Didn't read like a poem, did it? Yeah. It's like, it kind of like tells a story, but it's written in verse. Yeah, it, it rhymes. Well, it, it doesn't, it, in Greek it actually doesn't rhyme, it's, it's the meter. It's like a meter. Um, in English we use, we use end rhyme, it's called. Yeah. It's epic. The Odyssey, uh, the Iliad, the Aenid, um, those are all examples of, of epic. Beowulf is an epic. Um, that, that's a kind of poetry. I think Germanic languages actually use what's called um, Stab or stress rhyme uh, rather than end rhyme. The Nibelungenlied, if you've read that, you know, the story of these you know, Germans fighting each other, that's an epic. Uh, we have a lot of epics, don't we? So how do we like our epics? We can read some of them. But how do we really get them? Movies. Movies, yeah. Uh, if you want it to be truly epic, it's got to be at least two hours long, of course. Um, maybe make it a little bit longer. Miniseries work really well for epics. Um, they had other kinds of poetry as well. They had what we call lyric poetry, which is you know sort of expressive of the individual and, and their, their condition. What else? They had plays. We watch plays. We watch more plays than the Greeks did. We watch our plays on television. They're just, you know, um, filmed and edited. Uh, they're not so much live dramatic performances, which tend to be kind of highbrow, right? Um, the stuff that forms our popular culture. is what would count as poetry. 
So this, this class of poets is, is much broader um, than what we think. What about our whole music industry? Do you know any people who perhaps guide their lives a little bit too much by songs by a particular artist? Think about love songs and, and the, the messages that so many of them have and what the effects would be if you actually followed some of the, the advice or put yourself in the narrative of some of those love songs. Um, some of them might turn out okay. A lot of them would turn out pretty terrible. You know? <laughs> I'm going to stay with you forever even though you cheat on me and um, treat me wrong. I still love you. Is that healthy? Is that wise? I don't think so. <laughs> I hope none of you do. Um, now, Socrates is going to these people. So they have different roles in, in our society, but these classes are still there. And what happens? He goes first to the politicians. They claim to know. They claim to be wise. What are they wise about? What is politics really about? If you're kind of jaded, you might say making money. Right? Or putting people under your thumb. Crushing them. What? How to manage society. How to manage society, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of different ways you could go with that. And people always have different ideas about it. So the politicians are the ones who say, hey, look, I've got the best ideas. You should vote for me. Let me do what I think we ought to do or enact my policies. And you know, they, they give speeches or they give policy statements. Um, they're making claims to wisdom. They're making claims not only this is the best thing to do at the time, what do they base that on? Here's what the good is for human beings. Here's the, the better way to live. Um, and Socrates goes and he asks them, to you know, clarify what it is that they're saying. And it turns out that at least in ancient Athens, and I'll let you think about whether this is the case in our society or not. Maybe we don't have to extrapolate um, what Socrates did there. There he doesn't find anybody who satisfies him. And, and he actually says, you know, there were a lot of um, inferior people, people who didn't have positions of power, who seemed to know an awful lot more than these politicians did, don't they? This is where that, that issue about is the wisdom absolutely not there, or is there, is there some degree of wisdom? That's where that comes in. He says, there were some inferior people who seemed wiser. So if he's saying they're wiser, they must have some degree of wisdom. Um, what about the poets? They're not quite in the same case as the, uh, the politicians. He treats the politicians pretty roughly. They don't know anything. Do the poets know anything? They don't, know, they don't know about the most important thing, which is what they're generating. You ask them to explain, what are you talking about here? And it's, blah, 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 I don't, I don't know. You know? Uh, and Socrates says, well, you know, they're divinely inspired. It just comes to them, and, and, and they can't really give a, a good explanation of that. Um, it, you could ask yourself, is that true in our society? Are there, are there say, musicians who write songs, and you ask them, what is this song really about? And they can't explain it. I see some of you nodding. Oh, yeah. uh, I was curious because you said Socrates said they were divinely inspired. Yeah. But then Socrates was charged as an atheist. Yeah. So. Well, the charge yeah. doesn't doesn't hold up very well, does okay. it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's all these points throughout the whole thing where Miletus must have just been like, you know, wincing and, and, and wishing he hadn't charged him with with atheism. Um, he was going to hope that the other charge would, would stick. Um, the poets don't know about their own production. What do they, they do know about, about some things. And the craftsmen, go ahead. He said that the poets knew how to like, please the people. They didn't know what they were talking about, but they knew what to say in order for people to agree with them. Yeah. And, and the, now the tradespeople are a little bit different. They do know something. An electrician does know about electricity and where to put the conduit. Because if, if they screw it up, what happens? They don't stay an electrician for very long, do they? The potter actually knows how to make pottery. Where do they go wrong? Yeah. He said um, the artisans knew a lot of things in which Socrates was ignorant, but they fell into the same error as the poets. What was that? Like they they don't understand the meaning. Of you're, that, you're on the right track. They claimed to know more than they really did. 
Yeah. So because somebody's a really good electrician, he knows how society ought to be run. Because society is pretty much like an electrical box, you know. Or if they're a potter, um, you know, your, your love life isn't going well. Well, it's like this pot that I threw one time. Sometimes you just got to take the, the, you know, ruined stuff and throw it back in the kiln. Because a human, you know, a human being in a relationship is just like a pot. Um, you see the problem there? People go by what they do know and think they can extend that to everything else, especially the most important things in, in life. So they actually did have some wisdom, didn't they? But it was a limited wisdom. Um, let's skip ahead a little bit um, and look at the, the, these things about death. Now, Wisdom is going to be one of the key themes throughout this, this semester. Knowledge, wisdom, who has it, what is it, consistent, what do we mean by it. Death is another important theme. Um, I think I, may, I, I said this to the ethics class, not to you guys. This is a very morbid thought, um, but it, it's, you know, it's true. If you think about it, I mean, actually look around the room at all your fellow students. Now, every one of the, those people... Uh, one of three things is going to happen in relation to you. You're going to die before they do, they're going to die before you do, or you're going to die at the same time. Because the mortality rate is 100%. Um, and death is one of those things that uh, hopefully all of you are very far from it. You know, I'm hoping. That. I'm closer because I'm you know, 20 years further on than, than you guys are. Um, death is one of those things that we want to know about. A lot of people talk about you know, you know near-death experiences and what's the other side like. Socrates has some discussions about that, doesn't he? There's two things I'd like you to, to take away from um, this thinking about death. One of them is Socrates gives you some arguments why dying isn't going to be such a bad thing. And we'll look at those in a minute. He also says he doesn't mind dying in part because it's not really doing him any harm. Um, or great harm. What would be worse than dying for Socrates? What's a fate worse than death, as we sometimes say? Conforming to society, like what this, what this society wants him to do. Yeah, uh, sort of in, indirectly, because what is that going to require of him? Uh, stopping doing philosophy. But what else? Yeah. It's not you mean, like his true self or something. Okay, now that's these are both on the right track. He talks about in terms of this this unrighteousness, which is another way of translating injustice, being a, doing wrong things. To be a doer of wrong is worse than dying. Now that's kind of a strange thought, isn't it? So death would be an unspeakable game. Game. Uh, if it's no consciousness whatsoever. What's, what's, does anything strike you as kind of odd about that? A game for who? If you don't have any consciousness, are you gaining anything? Are you enjoying anything? Mm -hmm. There's really no you to, to benefit from that. Um, so that's kind of a bad argument. I mean, you, you, somebody could have responded to Socrates on that. What does he really think? I mean, this is, this is what he actually does think, that death is a journey to another place. And now here again is where the, the not so much living with your conscience, but uh, it, it, it is kind of tied to honor, the, the honor that other people give you. The afterlife, according to Socrates, is going to be either a good place or a bad place, um, more or less depending on what you bring to it. So if you're a bad person, you're going to show up in a place where you, know, you can't trick people anymore into supporting you or thinking you're a good person. You can't fool yourself anymore. You're going to be confronted with people who actually know what justice is, these wise judges. And they're going to you know, send you to a bad place or to a good place. And if you get sent to a good place, he says, if the pilgrim arrives in the world, if indeed when the pilgrim arrives in the world below, he's delivered from the professors of justice in this world, these, these people, and finds the true judges, 
that pilgrimage will be worth, worth making. What is he going to get to do there? I will be able to continue my search into true and false knowledge as in this world. So as in that, I will find out who really is wise. If these people here don't really possess wisdom, maybe once he gets down to the afterworld, the afterlife, um, he will encounter those who truly do have wisdom. And uh, he says, what infinite delight there would be in conversing with them and asking them questions. For in that world, they don't put a man to death for this. Um, now, so I'm going to leave you with this image of Socrates, you know, down there bothering all the people uh, in, in Hades and pestering them and not letting them go. What we're going to pick up with next week is Credo. And Credo begins in the prison cell the day before Socrates is supposed to be executed. In this one, he's very outspoken, right? The city, you know, I, I'm the gadfly. I get to poke the city and make it jump when I need to. In the Credo, he's going to say he has to obey the laws, even though the laws are going to put him to death. So think about that as you're, you're reading through it, and have a, a good weekend.